In the autumn of 2002, a ruthless killer stalked the suburbs of Washington, D.C. He only needed a split second and he could take them out. People were murdered at random. White people, black people, young, old, children. And then the killer vanished without a trace. How do you find a ghost? Millions lived in fear. I felt like the water was over my head. The sniper's high-powered rifles sent shockwaves across the country. People like this exist in our world. One of the largest manhunts in American history spread from coast to coast. There were many false leads, but eventually the murderer became careless, and the police were able to apprehend a pair of deranged killers. Montgomery County lies just north of Washington, D.C., in the state of Maryland. The capital of the United States has had a reputation for violent crime. But its suburbs are affluent, calm, safe places to raise kids. In 2002, the tranquility of the suburbs was shattered by the blast of a sniper's gun. It all began on October the 2nd at the Glenmont Shopping Center. James Martin was picking up some groceries after work before heading home to his wife and 11-year-old son. Out of nowhere, there was the sound of a gunshot. A shopper in the car park heard an unsettling groan. She looked up and saw James collapse on the ground. I'm at Shopper Street Warehouse on Randolph Road, and a man just fell in the parking lot. There was a loud noise, but we're not sure if he was shot. The frightened caller was hiding behind her car, clutching her five-year-old child. Is he bleeding? Yes. Where is he bleeding from? I, I don't know. I'm like half an aisle away from him. Is it inside? No, it's outside in a parking lot. Oh, there's a police officer here now. One well, of the first persons there was a police officer who heard the shot. James was unconscious and bleeding heavily from his chest. He was trying to lend medical attention to the victim, but he was also keeping his eyes out looking for suspect information. The victim died in minutes. A detective at the scene phoned Assistant Chief of Police Deirdre Walker. He explained the circumstances of James Martin's shooting, which were very deeply troubling, obviously. A small entrance wound and a large exit wound indicated that he had been killed by a shot from a high-powered rifle. I start running through my head the possible causes of something like this because in Montgomery County, we just don't have drive-by shootings involving high-powered weapons. I remember hanging up the phone and just having this feeling of wondering when the other shoe was going to drop. Police searched the area for bullet casings, but found none. They checked the car park for evidence, but found nothing. As night fell, police were left with no clues, only questions. Who would want to kill James Martin, and why? A terrifying answer began to form as the violence continued at about 7.40 the next morning. It was earlier in the morning and Sonny Buchanan was cutting the lawn. At first, neighbors thought Sonny's lawnmower had malfunctioned and injured him. The call first went out. It went out as a medical emergency. What's going on there? Uh, this guy's lawnmower did something, man. It chopped him up. He's bleeding real bad. He's down and out. But when paramedics arrived, it was clear that this was no accident. Sonny was rushed to a hospital. By then, his heart had stopped and was completely drained of blood. A doctor said he bled more than anyone he had ever seen. Sonny Buchanan was the son of a former Montgomery County police officer, so it kind of hit home. Sonny Buchanan's death was only the beginning of the bloodiest morning in the Montgomery County Police Department's history. At 8.07 a.m., a taxi pulled into a petrol station on Connecticut Avenue, about eight kilometers away. Caroline Namro was keeping an eye on her toddler as she filled her minivan. Suddenly, she heard the report of a gun. She was shocked to see a huge smear of blood across the side of her vehicle. And then, a sight she would never forget. The taxi driver was staggering towards her with a gunshot wound in his chest. Prem Kumar Walekar fell in front of her. What, male? Oh, my God, Male. 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 Male.
Listen to me. What I'm, is wrong? A man is being killed in front of me. How is he being killed in front of you? I don't know. Two brutal murders had been committed in 31 minutes, and the day's violence hadn't ended. Around breakfast time on October the 3rd, 2002, two men were shot dead in the normally peaceful suburbs just north of Washington, D.C. Each of them had been hit by a single bullet from a high-powered rifle. A few minutes later, the killer struck again. Sara Ramos had been waiting for a ride outside a senior housing complex called Leisure World. She had moved to the US from El Salvador in Central America. There she'd been a law student, but in the States, she made ends meet by cleaning houses. Fire and ambulance. Yes, I need the ambulance, please. Eyewitness accounts only added to the confusion. A girl just shot herself. She just shot herself. Oh, we got a possible 1056 at Leisure Wood. Please advise. It was the third brutal murder in less than an hour. It came out as a, a possible suicide, and that I knew instantly it wasn't. I don't see a weapon. You don't see a weapon? No. This time, police found the bullet that had shattered Sarah's skull. The 223 caliber bullet entered her forehead, exited through her neck, went through a window, and landed on the floor of the restaurant behind her. Chaotic radio traffic filled the airwaves as emergency response teams raced to keep up with the murders. But the killer was relentless. His next victim was Laurie Lewis Rivera, who was cleaning her car at a petrol station. The quiet suburbs had never seen anything like this. We're having a shooting about every half an hour. All five killings were clustered in 25 square kilometers of Montgomery County. The annual homicide rate had just shot up 30%. There had been another incident about an hour before James Martin was shot while shopping. Less than five kilometers from the supermarket, employees at a craft store heard a loud crack and found a bullet hole in their window. The round just went high. It actually entered at about the six foot level in the window. They've recovered some fragments from an artificial flower in the store. So far, the police had found no connection between any of the victims. Different ages, different sexes, different races of the victims. Uh, that was the most uh, troubling part. And there had been no secondary crimes like robbery at any of the shootings. We knew we had to counter this threat, and we knew we had to do it immediately. A sniper, or possibly a team of snipers, was stalking the people of Montgomery County. So right away, we had to put all our assets out. We had to put them out immediately. We had to go with a quick plan. SWAT teams were deployed throughout the area. We were going to engage this guy, that he was pulling us along, and we were going to end up in a hot confrontation with him. While police marksmen waited for a possible shootout, other snipers helped with the investigation. We sent out our trained snipers to go to each location to come back and report what they believe happened in these locations. The locations were all in public places. Undercover cops flooded similar areas, hoping to catch the killer in the act. At each crime scene, the detectives faced the same nagging question. Where could someone with a rifle have hidden? There is no forest or woodland. There is no cover. And for no lookouts to come out, we realized that maybe a vehicle could be involved. The one and only lead police had so far seemed to support this theory. We had a witness who had seen a white panel truck in the area where uh, the victim up at Leisure World had been. Uh, apparently, this witness had heard the shot, turned around, and saw that white panel truck. Suddenly, it seemed as if white vans and panel trucks were everywhere. Police knew they would find more clues in the bodies of the victims. There were now five corpses at the coroner's office. The autopsies could provide crucial evidence. We had to look at if there was any elevation, which would lead us to believe they were taking these shots from rooftops. And we also needed to know what type of damage occurred to these victims on that day. But even before the forensics could be completed, another panicked call came in. Yeah, we got a guy just shot out here. That night, 
Pascal Charlot, an elderly Haitian immigrant, was gunned down while crossing the road. He was just over the Montgomery County border in Washington, D.C. I went to the scene on that, and it kind of led me to believe, like, maybe they saw that this individual was in Washington, D.C., and they wanted to extend the killing field to another location within the metropolitan area. On October the 4th, 2002, Washington, D.C. area residents awoke to a new reality. Pumping gas, going outside, you're much more aware of what's going on around you. The fear was palpable. There was just this sense of... Um, of foreboding uh, as people went about doing their work. Six innocent people had been gunned down in less than 48 hours. Police had no suspects, no motive, and very few leads. Now, everyone felt like a target. When people went to put gas in their car, they would bob and weave. People walked down the street, they wouldn't walk in a straight line. Montgomery County Police Chief Charles Moose selected his most experienced detective to lead the investigation. Barney Forsyth. The chief, of course, asked me, he says, what's the link? And I said, chief, at this point, we don't see a link. And so that's the commonality, is that there is no link. And of course, that's one of the most difficult type of cases to deal with. Chief Moose made an early decision to deal with the crisis by presenting as much information as possible to the public. They still all appear to be random victims, don't appear to be anyone's enemy, don't appear to be involved in anything coordinated just simply random targets. Schools went into lockdown. With armed guards out front, helicopters were everywhere. Meanwhile, the autopsy results showed a consistent pattern. Analysis of the bullets indicated that they came from a long-range rifle, possibly a Bushmaster. These rifles that are military rifles, they're built to kill. They're not built just to hurt somebody, they're built to kill them. It goes in small, and then it gets wider as it goes through. So what you end up with is that all those organs that are in that range of that cone get injured, whether they get hit directly by the bullet or not. The Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms is the main national agency that deals with gun-related crime in the United States. Its ballistics lab ran a trajectory analysis. We looked at the different rounds, the way the round uh, hit the victim, and that helped us figure out where the shot may have been taken from. The shots were not coming from rooftops. Somehow, the killer was finding a way to hide in public places. Investigators began to believe that the sniper was shooting from a vehicle, which led to a theory that a pair of shooters might be involved. For the purposes of shooting, you want to have room available so you can have some mobility, and that means when you're behind the wheel, you don't have that kind of mobility. The idea that the armed sniper was hiding in a vehicle spread fear like wildfire. Washington area residents were already on edge. It was just a year since the 9-11 attacks, and there had also been an anthrax scare, during which five people had lost their lives and 17 had been infected. Now, they faced the possibility that a team of terrorists was hunting them down. The Washington Post, on the front page, says snipers and Al-Qaeda. Those questions were being publicly asked. On the afternoon of October the 4th, the sniper changed tactics. He moved south of Washington. Spot 2911, what's your emergency? Um, we've had a lady shot in our parking lot. This is Michaels in Fredericksburg. Caroline Sewell was gunned down in Virginia as she loaded craft supplies into her minivan. Get away from the window. I'm sorry. Where is the person at? She's laying in the parking lot, sir. While lying on the pavement, Caroline prayed that she could live for her two children. Say that again, honey. She's laying on the ground between our store and Michael, and she is moving her arm. There's a lady standing over. There's a lady standing with her. She would become the first survivor of the sniper's long-range bullets. This was the second shooting incident at a branch of the craft store. Investigators immediately seized on a link that could lead to the killer. So we looked at disgruntled employees, people that maybe had been terminated, some connection between the Michaels in Maryland and the Michaels in Fredericksburg. Um, of course, nothing was really um, developed. There was nothing there. There was so little, in fact, at every crime scene. After each killing, the gunman vanished into thin air. Detectives were mystified. We had no 
physical description. We had no good eyewitnesses. How do you draw up a plan to find a ghost? In a desperate move, police chief Moose asked the public for help. We're still convinced that people have seen something. We want to talk to them. We want to follow up. A tip line was immediately overwhelmed by callers who were sure they knew the sniper. We had over 100,000 tips come in to the tip line, which is astronomical. Detectives began working around the clock to follow every worthwhile lead. Meanwhile, Assistant Chief Drew Tracy scrutinized the sniper's every move in search of a pattern. They were close to major roadways. We realized there were strip malls, and we realized that certain st stores were consistent at these places. We also realized that they knew the traffic patterns in the area of Montgomery County. Rather than get stuck in heavy southbound traffic, the killer, or killers, traveled north after a morning shooting. They went to the path of least resistance. Based on those movements, police devised a scheme to trap the sniper. It was called the Concentric Circle Plan. An immediate response team will be ready to deploy within one minute of an emergency call. If we got the information within a minute, the most they could have gone was a half mile to a mile, whether it was on foot or in a vehicle. Police teams would then create a trap consisting of a series of widening circles around the area. And our goal was to be on scene within two to three minutes immediately after receiving information. And basically, we would try to roadblock every one of these locations with a uniform presence. We would flood internally with plainclothes operatives. Roadblocks began to spring up everywhere. We needed to lock them into a certain location. Police searched white vans and every other suspicious vehicle. One of the biggest manhunts in US history was underway. And yet, the sniper seemed to stay one step ahead, slipping away after every shooting. We would get ourselves just about where we thought we had things under control when something would happen in another jurisdiction. The high kill rate suggested a particular kind of suspect. We were dealing with a trained individual, hunters, have this expertise. Military has this expertise. Trained law enforcement would have this expertise. Based on the tight cluster of shootings on the first two days, police had been looking for suspects in that part of Montgomery County. But the Caroline Sewell case in Fredericksburg, Virginia, had expanded the attack zone tenfold. The killer could be anywhere. And as the weekend approached, an entire region held its breath what would be next. The killer might not be a local resident, as they had first suspected. The safety of school children was a particular concern. I had three young children. I ran them through parking lots. I made them go down on the floorboard of the car when I got gas. Throughout the weekend, school and police officials debated whether or not schools should close. It was decided that schools would remain open, but the pupils would stay indoors. I had my kids telling me, Mom, you have to go to work. You have to go to work till you catch them. We need to go back out for recess. So, you know, it's a different perspective, but it was all that you could think about. So far, none of the shootings had happened near schools. But that was about to change. 13-year-old Iron Brown had been kicked off his school bus the week before. He'd gotten in trouble for eating candy on the bus, and his aunt had to take him to school. Iron's aunt dropped him off at school an hour early, because she had to get to work. News of the sniper shooting was constantly on the radio. No incidents, no activities at the school. A uh, very safe day for young people. She turns around and there he is lying on the ground, bleeding. Iran Brown was, was really uh, losing consciousness in the car. His aunt was a nurse, she was trained and she called the hospital ahead of time and she was racing through traffic. And she kept saying to him, hang in there, hang in there, I love you. When I first saw Iron, he was trying to die and I wasn't sure where we, whether we were gonna be able to turn that around or not. This is our home, this is our community. We, we took an oath to protect and serve and these guys come in and make a mockery. Fear. You see the looks of people out here. It's just, just, just uncontrolled fear right now. Once that child had been shot uh, in our neighboring county of Prince George's, 
it was like uh, things had escalated and as bad as they were and we didn't think they could get much worse they did get worse we truthfully are a bit nervous about just standing still like now i'm standing here with you and you know i'm kind of looking around because i'm thinking really should i stand here i mean i've got a car behind me and a building over behind you and so there is some some protection if you will but again you don't know nobody was safe and i think people had a pretty good grasp of that i mean you're supposed to feel safe when you're right in front of school and somebody gets shot you gotta get rushed to the hospital it's kind of scary this is just unbelievable and there's no sense you can put to this i mean it's just a random act of violence in the most serene neighborhood you can possibly have. We were pressed more and more. In fact, my own wife started to uh, not believe me, saying, you know, are our kids safe? And I couldn't answer that because I, I didn't know. Ever since everything started, I haven't been allowed to go anywhere. I've been in my house. They you just know, cancel the games. Wait a second. This is a grown-up softball league. Mm -hmm. You're adults. Mm -hmm. They've canceled that too? Yes. Why? For the safety of us. We, we talked about wherever the, you are, whatever you're doing, when you're coming to school, coming off the bus, look around, look around. And I've been doing that at service stations and all kinds of things, everywhere I go. Parents felt like their children weren't safe, and they weren't. No one knew who would be shot next. No, they generally take the bus uh, right in front of the door, but uh, since uh, the sniper is around, we don't know what's going on. I have to take them to school myself. Well, we have to go on. We can't keep our kids away from our, their education just because of this. Because I need light. We all need fresh air and the shades are down. And I go to my friend's house, but really I'm not allowed outside anymore. Hopefully it, this stops, this craziness stops today. Knowing the full effect of these events on the community he had vowed to protect, the pressure began to mount for Chief Moose. Stepping over the line, shooting a kid. I guess it's getting to be really, really personal now. Many were startled to see the police chief cry, but those close to the investigation understood. The police felt as though they were failing the community as they were unable to stop this elusive and ruthless killer. During five days in October 2002, there had been seven shooting incidents in the Washington DC area. They had all involved a single round from a high-powered rifle the local police force seemed unable to put a stop to the shooting spree. However, the FBI brought in greater resources to search for the serial killer. A $200,000 reward was offered for information leading to an arrest. Back at the scene of schoolboy Iron Brown's shooting, investigators undertook a forensic walk, stepping slowly, shoulder to shoulder, through the area. And two of them discovered what they thought looked like um, a flattened out area in the shrubs where maybe somebody had been laying and they pursued that area much more intensely and with a metal rake found the shell casing. They also found a pen barrel with the ink cartridge removed. It was sent to a forensic lab to check it for DNA. But the biggest find of the day was a mysterious tarot card. And it said, for you, Mr. Police, code, call me God, do not release to the press. So they were using the code, call me God. It was almost like a calling card saying that it's us again and we did it. At that point in time, they did not ask for anything. And that's a scary situation. The suspects made it very clear uh, that they did not want the media notified with regard to this. The task force wanted to honor the killer's request in order to establish communication but the media were everywhere. No secret was safe. Police were determined to keep the tarot card evidence away from the press. The next day, the tarot card information was leaked and it pretty much made the front page of the Washington Post. This is the kind of reporting uh, that, while I understand wanting to get a big story, can be very devastating to a case. While the investigation seemed stalled, there was a spot of good news. We have been taking care of a young man. Iron Brown, the 13-year-old shot at school that morning, was going to live. Shell casings from his shooting strongly suggested that a Bushmaster rifle had been used, a weapon that could be lethal in the hands of somebody with little training. Thank you, Chief. Sorry to keep everyone waiting tonight. I talked about uh, 
that you don't have to be have a military training or be an expert marksman with this gun. The investigators had to be careful about information released to the media. At one stage, Mike Bouchard had noted that all the victims had been shot in the torso. After I'm Dean Myers was a civil engineer who had been decorated for service in Vietnam. He was on his way from Virginia to Maryland. He was leaving work. And he just stopped to get gas because he had a long ride home back to Gaithersburg. And he got out of the car and he's pumping gas. A 223 caliber bullet ripped through his skull. It was October the 9th. If you get a bullet wound like that to the head, it doesn't matter what you do, you're dead. There's nothing we can do. Two days later, Ken Bridges was killed, also at a petrol station in Virginia. On October the 14th, the sniper struck again in Virginia. Ted and Linda Franklin had just bought some shelves and were loading them into their vehicle. When Ted moved towards the front of the vehicle to adjust a seat, Linda walked to the rear. She was standing still when the fatal bullet hit. It was another shot to the head. The right side of Linda Franklin's head was completely blown off. She was the 11th victim of the DC sniper and we felt with each new one that we weren't being successful at doing our job and protecting this community. But at this shooting, a witness came forward. Now, that was the first good information we had of a possible suspect as well as a good descriptor of a vehicle. Sort of a, a cream or white color Chevy van. Matthew Dowdy said he was walking out of the hardware store when he saw the killer. A... Uh, Mid-Eastern style male, complected, crouching down, taking a shot. He described a white or cream-colored van with a burnt-out rear light. An alert went out to the public. We do want people to continue to watch for things that are out of place, strange behavior, report that. I'm pleased to say that people continue to call our tip line. There are more bad guys than there are cops but there aren't more bad guys than there are good guys. So when you put the good guys out there and you ask them to help you with the task, it's a force multiplier. And that's what we were counting on in this case. Two days later, a detective was reviewing the surveillance tapes from the hardware store. At 9.21 p.m., Dowdy appeared on the in-store security videotape, three minutes after the shooting. When they realized that this was a, a false lookout, and that uh, false suspect information. The eyewitness turned out to be a hoax, just someone looking for media attention. Two weeks after the shooting began, the investigators were back to square one. All the possible suspects from the surveillance tape recorded during Linda Franklin's shooting were eliminated. Sleep deprived and frustrated, the investigators knew that to catch the sniper, they'd have to work even harder. You just couldn't walk away from the case. I didn't want to go off shift. Um, you know, your boss has had to send you home. Uh, get your sleep, you're gonna have to come back tomorrow, it's a new day. And you'd go home, and on your way home, there was another shooting incident just around the corner. Before this case, Barney Forsyth had been planning to retire from the police force, but those plans were now on hold. It would have been very difficult for me to walk out the door and turn this over to somebody else. Then a lead came from an unexpected place, Tacoma in the state of Washington, on the other side of the country. But again, we encourage everyone to call. Don't assume we have your information. Do not assume that the information you have is no good. As Robert Holmes watched the coverage of the DC sniper shootings, he had an alarming revelation. He somehow has his gut feeling that his friend John Muhammad is behind this. John Muhammad had been his buddy in the army. He owned a long-range rifle, just like the one shown in the news reports. And here was the clincher. John had an estranged wife who had taken custody of their children and moved to the Washington, D.C. area. So he calls the tip line, and his tip gets completely lost. Ironically, the sniper wanted to talk to the task force, too. But he also had trouble getting through. Brassel City Police, love calls to find your cordon. Good morning. Don't say anything. Just listen. Where are the people that are causing the killing in your area? Look on the tarot card. It says, call me God. Sir, anything for you is at Montgomery County Police Hotline. 
We're not investigating the car line. Do you like the number? Further complicating the situation, other callers were also taking credit for the crimes. The real sniper got lost in the shuffle. They got desperate for law enforcement to, to accept that they were the killers when they called, so they brought up a shooting in Montgomery, Alabama, and asked us to look into that shooting. It was a, you gotta believe me, I'm the sniper, and here's how you can tell I'm the sniper. I immediately called uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and I asked if anyone handled a situation at an ABC store, and he said, he said yes, we had a robbery, homicide. The liquor store shooting was unsolved, and the gun used in the crime was not a Bushmaster. The DC sniper didn't rob his victims. There didn't seem to be a connection. On October the 19th, Jeff and Stephanie Hopper were driving to their home in Florida. When they pulled off the interstate highway some 150 kilometers south of Washington to fill up their car and have dinner, they thought they were out of the danger zone. They were walking out of the Ponderosa restaurant together after a nice dinner and they were holding hands. They heard a gun report. It took a moment before Jeff realized he had been shot in the abdomen. His wife struggled to unlock her cell phone to call for help. It took five operations over 18 days to save Jeff's life. In the woods near the restaurant, an ATF dog found a bullet casing and a note tacked to a tree. The note was tucked inside a Ziploc bag the sniper left vital evidence. There was DNA on the Ziploc bag that the note was contained in. It's actually one of the ways in which law enforcement can pick up DNA is with a Ziploc mechanism that, that draws the DNA from the fingers as you, as you do that. The DNA, however, didn't match anything in the FBI's national database. However, the note was intriguing. For you, Mr. Police, call me God. And then it went on to make demands, very specific demands of what was expected of law enforcement to make the killings end. The sniper wanted $10 million deposited in a bank account. Once I heard that they were looking for really an exorbitant amount of money, but I really felt very confident that we were gonna get them. The sniper also wrote that at 6 a.m. he would call the restaurant where Jeffrey Hopper had been shot. We missed the time cutoff because of the DNA analysis. So Chief Moose went out with a very specific communication in a press conference following the discovery of what was on the note. To the person who left us a message at the Ponderosa last night, we do want to talk to you. Call us at the number you provided. Thank you. On the morning of October the 21st, the call came. Finally, the police and the sniper were in direct contact. The voice on the phone told the police to follow the demands from the note or more people would be killed. They were to tell the press that the sniper had been caught like a duck in a noose. It ended with a chilling warning. P.S. Your children are not safe. The call was tracked to a petrol station. 33 minutes later, two men were arrested. One was driving a white panel truck. But these men were simply two illegal immigrants near the phone at the wrong time. The task force regrouped and focused on the strange wording in the sniper's last message. You caught the sniper like a duck in a noose. Um, we didn't know what that meant when we first read it. We, uh, we all looked at each other cross-eyed and didn't know what, what those words meant. The sniper's note mentioned the Alabama shooting once again. A second call to Montgomery revealed more information. A magazine had been dropped at the crime scene. It had a fingerprint on it, but local officials said they had not processed the print. The magazine was immediately flown to Washington. And lo and behold, the fingerprint matches Lee Boyd Malvo. Lee Boyd Malvo was a 17-year-old from Jamaica. He had been fingerprinted by immigration officials in Bellingham, Washington. So that gave us basically an individual and a face to a fingerprint Police were convinced that the teenager had an accomplice. If we could just have 24 hours with this information before the media gets a hold of it, that we could catch them. But if this were to leak, they would be in the wind and 
probably not surface for a very long time. Just as police felt they were hot on their trail, the snipers struck again. They came back and they hit us once again in the heart of Montgomery County on October 22nd. Conrad Johnson, a bus driver, was the next victim. He was shot and killed as he was at the front steps of his bus, ready to do his route. At the scene, a new message had been tacked to a tree. Your incompetence has cost you another life. The police were determined to turn this incompetence into an arrest. They had a fingerprint, a photograph, and a name, Lee Boyd Malvo. He was born in Jamaica. An immigration report revealed a custody battle between his mother and a man named John Muhammad. Muhammad had helped Malvo and his mother enter the United States illegally from the Caribbean. John Muhammad and Lee Malvo became friends, often passing themselves off as father and son. In Tacoma, FBI agents played the tapes of the sniper for Muhammad's friend, Robert Holmes. He was a longtime friend of John Muhammad's from the army. They confided in each other. Um, who is this? Don't say anything. Just listen. Robert had called the tip line five days earlier, but failed to get through. He recognized the voice as Lee Malvo, a kid who hung out with Muhammad. He also gave the agents a possible motive. He knew that John Muhammad was devastated when he lost his children to Mildred. Mildred was John Muhammad's ex-wife. When Muhammad had threatened to kill her, she moved to the Washington, D.C. area with their children. Robert Holmes led the agents to a tree stump in his backyard that Malvo and Muhammad had used for target practice. Back in Maryland, the task force was closing in on their suspects. We ended up getting the uh, tag number, which was a New Jersey plate, description of the vehicle uh, listed to Mr. Muhammad. We knew we were looking for a blue Chevy Caprice with New Jersey tags, and we realized we were looking for at least two or more individuals. We're keeping our fingers crossed that this is the right thing. Whitney Donahue repaired industrial refrigerators for a living. He had been working late on October the 24th in Virginia. At about 11.30, I decided to go home. I got my van started on the Route 66. Home was a couple of long, dark hours away. To stay awake, he turned on the radio. We are looking for a blue Chevy Caprice with New Jersey tags, NDA. Whitney had owned a Chevy Caprice, so he knew exactly what he was looking for. I started scanning the cars as I went in towards the Beltway. And then I got on Route 70 and decided to stop at the rest area on South Mountain. And as I turned in, I seen the Caprice. It was dark blue. And then as I came on in, I could see the front tag. And it was what I had written down. And I pulled in right directly across in front of them, picked up my cell phone, and uh, called 911. The noose was about to tighten around the necks of what were now a pair of sitting ducks. Through good police work, some lucky breaks, and a tip from an observant member of the public, the task force hunting the DC sniper were about to make the arrest. This would end a 21-day reign of terror. Tactical teams prepared for a shootout. These are the same individuals who trained together and worked together for the prior two and a half to three weeks. They planned the takedown, they got in the wood line, and they executed. I remember looking down at Malvo and seeing beads of sweat on his forehead. And this is October, it was cool, and he didn't say a word. And I looked down, walked over to John Muhammad, and I saw his face. He was angry. It was a quick operation, and everybody knew we had them, and everybody was relieved, and everybody was glad it was over. I was extremely tired, both uh, physically and psychologically. But as exhausted as he was, there was one thing Barney Forsyth had to do. I stopped actually by the school that, where my wife, Marsha, works. Uh, called her out of her classroom and put my arms around her. And I said, we got him. 
I said, you can't tell anybody right now because it hadn't been released, but we got them. We are gathered to share some information with regards to a sniper situation that has been occurring in the Washington metropolitan area. At approximately 1 o'clock a.m. today, a motorist called 911 to report seeing a 1990 Chevy Caprice. And I was home at the time watching the news, and my kids were there, and they were, you know, jumping up and down. Does this mean we're going to have recess again? We can at least say that there's some family that's going to be together tonight because we've got it done. For several days, Lee Boyd Malvo remained silent. But finally, Detective June Boyle got him to talk. Would you like some juice, maybe, or some fruit, or some salad? He was hungry. He wanted a veggie burger, and that started the process. We sent out for a veggie burger, two of them, in fact, and uh, some water. Once he started eating and talking, everything just flowed pretty well. Malvo told her that he would fast before killing because it improved his aim. He just was bragging about how they had planned to do five killings in one day, he said, because he knew the police couldn't handle it. He gave details of each killing. In the Franklin shooting, he said he aimed at Ted Franklin first. And Lynn Franklin moved to the back of the car. He said it only took him two seconds. He locked onto her and shot her. He pointed to his head, laughed about it, said it was a great shot. Malvo began to open up slowly, revealing information about his relationship with John Allen Muhammad. He referred to Muhammad as sometimes his best friend, sometimes his father, but they were very tight. Everything they did, they did together. He and John Muhammad trained shooting out in the state of Washington, and he talked about that. They would shoot. He said, we taught each other everything. Today, many investigators believe the killing spree was a twisted plot by John Muhammad to kill his ex-wife and get his children back. I think it's very plausible that he intended to kill her and make her one of the random victims. John Muhammad had hatred. He was involved, I think, when they finally put it all together at the end, it was between 24 and 26 shootings throughout this nation that were involved by both of these individuals. He taught hatred to Lee Boyd Malvo. In 2004, John Allen Muhammad was sentenced to death by a Virginia court. He is appealing that verdict. 17-year-old Lee Boyd Malvo received a life sentence. Two years later, a Maryland court sentenced each of them to six consecutive life terms.